Well, good evening. Good evening. It's good to see you uh, and exciting to jump in uh, here with uh, week two material on week three of the study, right? That's, that's how we're clear as mud there, correct? Well, hey, let's pray and we're going to jump in, okay? We've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. And so let's just get right to it, but let's open with prayer, okay? Father, thank you for this evening. Uh, thank you for your word. Uh, God, thank you for how magnificently you have put it together uh, in order for us to understand who you are, to understand what you're doing, and God, to learn how we can apply it to our lives um, God, to experience all that you created us for, um, and God, to understand your plan of redemption, which just shows us your heart um, and your, your love for us, um, and God, which should motivate us to live lives of surrender uh, to you. So God, as we study your word, God, may we do so, so that we live lives that glorify you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so get your Bibles out tonight. We are going to, in addition to having your notes there, okay, you're going to have to multitask this evening. And you're going, I want you to follow along this evening because we are going to go through Genesis chapter 3, section by section in little chunks. Uh, but I want you to be able to follow along in your Bible as we do. Uh, so you'll have to just get in a rhythm of going back and forth from note-taking that you want to do to, to looking at the text. But before we jump into verse 1 of chapter 3, we need to flip back uh, a, few, a page or maybe just look back in a different column on the same page to Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 because this verse is really, we need to understand this verse in order to really understand what's going on in Genesis chapter 3. So let's read Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. And it says, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Who is saying these words in Genesis chapter 2? Yeah, this, these are the words of God. Who is he speaking to? Adam and Eve. Very good. So file that away because we're going to need to remember that. And remember exactly what, what God is saying to Adam and Eve as we unpack Genesis chapter 3. So that's one of the things we need. The other thing I want us to take a minute to do before we jump in is to think about the first character in the story, in the narrative that we are introduced to. Because this will help set the stage and give us some framework of what's going on. The third word, now the what? Serpent. So let's stop right there and think about who is this serpent? Satan. Satan, right? So is this an embodiment? Is this a physical embodiment of Satan? Or is this serpent a symbol for Satan? <laughs> yeah, we don't know, right? Moses doesn't tell us, right? It must not be an important detail for us to know, is this Satan in this serpent, or is this just a symbol for, for Satan? But what we do know is, is that this serpent, right, is carrying out the plan of, of Satan in this case. So you see some scriptures there that, that I've listed for you about this serpent. So if this will help give us what scripture reveals just a little bit about who Satan is. It's going to help us understand him as our enemy. It's going to help us understand how he operates, what his nature is. And even the language of some of these passages will point back. It'll have imagery from Genesis chapter 3. So the first one um, in, in Revelation, look at that Revelation passage there. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 you don't have to flip there. I will flip there. And I will read this. Listen, listen to this. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
So we get a little clarification here, don't we, about who this serpent is, right? In Revelation, hey, the, the dragon, the dragon in Revelation, right? John tells us, he identifies him, hey, this is the same, this is that serpent of old that was in the garden. We've got a couple of passages here in Isaiah and Ezekiel where in, in these prophecies that have to do with kings of, 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 of Babylon in Isaiah and the king of Tyre in Ezekiel, as in these, in these prophecies about these kings, woven in here is this understanding of the spiritual force that is behind these wicked kings and these wicked nations, right? And we get this descriptive language of, of Satan himself. He's called in Isaiah the son of the dawn. He's called the one who weakens the nations. In Ezekiel 28, it says that he is in Eden. It says that he was beautiful. It says he was covered in precious stones. And then it has a very important phrase in Ezekiel that's so key for us to understand. It talks about the day he was created. Now, why is that important? That he, was, that he was created, correct? Because if, if we're not careful, when we unpack Genesis 3 and here's the serpent and the serpent goes, goes, serpent goes about his plan of deception, right, and, 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 and rebellion and everything that he's doing to work against God, it would be very easy for us to just step back with kind of like a storytelling mentality and say, well, the serpent represents the God's equal on the evil side, right? He is the anti-God. He's the one that just directly opposes God. And it's going to be this battle between, between good and evil, right? And, and we could see Satan in, in that way. But we need to be very clear that we understand the Bible never sets Satan up at that level as, as this, as this anti-God. He is a created being, right? Which all created buildings come, beings come under the authority, right? And, and must ultimately bow in submission to, to the sovereign creator, right? To, to our God. So very important that we remember that as we unpack this. So one other thing about the enemy, about Satan, about this serpent, before we really dig in uh, to unpacking this text, it says there, now the serpent was more what? Hey, shrewd. Somebody's Bible says shrewd. What's another? Cunning, crafty, right? So, so that word there in, in the Hebrew language has positive, it's, it's used positively in the Old Testament, but it's also used negatively. When it's used positively, it has more of the idea of prudence. So you will read it in Proverbs, uh, a couple of different instances in Proverbs where, where this same word is used, but it's talking more about prudence, right? But in this case, we understand something about, about the nature of the serpent, about the nature of, of the devil. It says he is crafty, right? So it really kind of brings out possibly this idea that Lucifer, who was this beautiful, created being, that if we were to really unpack passages all through the Old Testament and even in the New, we would see this high position that, that Lucifer held before he was cast out of heaven. And, we would, and so we could really see, hey, something that was a virtue, something that was a strength, he was, he was prudent, right? He, he was probably crowned with more of this characteristic than any other created being, right? But in his rebellion, in his, in his being cast out of heaven, this thing that was a virtue really became a vice. And now we see it being distorted and being used to bring about what we're going to read in Genesis chapter 3. So does that make sense? Just kind of setting that stage of what we're looking at, who we're looking at. You want to add anything about the serpent before we... Yeah, I would, I would, uh, we're going to hit on this a, a little bit later. I, I know that I mean, the reason we're covering these, these first two weeks and we're laying this foundation um, is we're going to walk through threads and themes of the Bible that 
that you're going to see repeatedly, okay? Uh, but these first two lessons are so important because they set the entire framework for everything else that unfolds. But Daniel and I have talked about this. We, we know that, like, you could read Genesis 3 and think, oh my gosh, is, is this in our Bible? Is this like a nursery rhyme for kids? Is this, is this the story about how the snake lost his legs? And, and you, you work through this, this idea of this symbol-ladenness of, of what's taking place. There's, there's a talking snake. And so it, exactly deciphering the, the exact line of the this, of this symbol-ladenness uh, can be difficult. Uh, but that said, as it's introduced and as we unfold this passage, we, we think it'll become pretty clear that's what's happening here is that uh, when Moses writes this, he's, he's in a culture uh, where snakes are already, I mean, they're, they're kind of a curious creature, how they move and like, man, what is that? That's weird. That's different. And, and so that aspect is being pulled in here in terms of the, the symbol ladenness of this talking snake, and, and we'll see he'll lose his legs and slither on the ground. So we'll unfold that a little bit. Uh, but all of that becomes important as you flesh out the details of he's crafty, he's the most crafty of who's been created. He is created, but he's a talking snake, okay? So yeah, we're, this is where we're unfolding. And, and we think as it gets unfolded, you'll actually realize this is a magnificent piece of scripture because it, the way it unfolds uh, tells us so much about who we are and who God is. Amen. All right, so let's jump in. Let's jump in with the time we've got left here. Let's look at the first six verses. Um, so let, let's read those here. Jason, you want to yeah. read those? So I'm reading out of the New American Standard, Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, uh, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the, the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So you're going to see as we go through here, we, we listed this. as There's four keys in this, in this chapter to understanding what's going on in the fall. So this first movement, these first six verses, right, can really be summarized with three words. Deceitfulness, repulsiveness, and rebelliousness. Right? And we see that play out in, in this past, in these verses that Jason just read. But we're going to look at, in particular, three phrases that you see that, that really jump out in these six verses. We could spend the whole night just on these six verses, but we're going to really look at three phrases. So the first one, from the serpent, he says, has God said it's an important phrase because in this moment, he's planting a seed in the woman's brain that somehow humanity has the ability to stand in judgment of what God says. Do you see that there? Even just, has God said, let, let's question God for a minute, right? Like, look, help me out here. Like, can you even, like the serpent, hey, come here for a minute. Has God said... Right, as if we get to be the one to determine and, and stand in judgment and, uh, about what God has said and the validity of it. Yeah. Right? Was, that, was that valid? Was that a, hey, what do you think about what God said? 
Exactly. It, I mean, it's, it's subtle. It's subtle in this moment, but, but, it's, but it's profound in its impact. Right? I mean, even think, think, as we're reading through this chapter, just keep this in your mind. Think about how we see Genesis chapter 3 and what's going on here playing out even in our culture and in, in, in our world today. Right? Do, do, are, is, is, there, is there a push? Is there a, an effort for, for, for humanity to position itself in a way that says we get to evaluate God? To place ourselves on that footing of we are equal, you know, at least with God. If he even exists, right? It's still, it, it, ultimately it's up to me to decide what I'm going to do with it, right? And we see that right here with the serpent. He introduces this idea, but he goes beyond that, doesn't he? Look at what he says. Has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? What's wrong with that statement? Yeah, that's why we said you've got to understand Genesis 2.17 to really be able to, to understand this. What did God actually say? Yeah, it says, but from one particular tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Right? Correct. And we're going to get there in just a minute. But I just want you to understand just the, the initial one there. He says, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree? Well, that's not at all what God said. He didn't say anything about any tree. It was one particular tree. Right? So there's what the serpent's doing. What is Eve's response? Well, well, what is he doing? If you had to put a word to what he just did, what did he do? Good word. Yeah, he's 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 slide he exaggerates, right? And he's sliding something in. What is he suggesting? That's right. He said doubting God's goodness. There's a commentator that uh, Daniel and I love. It says he's suggesting that God is a cosmic party pooper. <laughs> is God holding out on you? Can, has he not let you eat from any of them? It exaggerates it, and it slides in the suggestion. God is not good. He's holding out on you. He's a cosmic party pooper. He's put you in this garden full of all these trees, and he says you can't have any of yeah, it. Yeah, he just made it so you could look at it, but you can't, you, you can't have any of it. Right. I mean, it, it's there, right? We, we, as, we, as we dig in, we see that. And man, Eve, verse 2 uh, and verse 3 Oh, you, you have, if you don't know the rest of Genesis chapter 3, man, you want to get really excited with her initial response. It says, the woman said to the serpent, hey, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. So she corrects the serpent. Like, no, 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 that's not what God said. God said we may eat. It says, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat. Okay, still, she's doing really well. Right? I mean, it's textbook in how we resist temptation, right? How we confront the lies of the enemy, right? With the truth of what God actually said. Ah, if there wasn't the next part of that phrase, what does she then say? Yeah, God said, we shall not eat from it or touch it. Again, back to Genesis 2, 17. Is that what God said? No, so now Eve is falling in line with what Satan's doing. She's exaggerating. He is a cosmic party pooper. <laughs> he really we is can't even holding touch out. It. Yeah. That one can't even touch it. So, I mean, so even just right out of the gate, we see the deceit of the enemy. And even just if we stop and really contemplate what's going on here, it should be repulsive. To think that the created beings, right, man and woman, right, formed out of the dust, right, all God's doing would somehow have this arrogance to say, I get to determine, I get to evaluate the validity of who you are and what you say. And it really, it's not about what you say, it's, it's what I want to do with what you say. 
I mean, it should, those first verses should repulse you with just how the enemy works and even what we're seeing happen here in this moment and, and the seeds of rebellion that are being sown in, in these first few verses. Yeah, because to question God's goodness. Let, let's say there's a hundred trees in the garden. We don't know how big it is. Let's say there's a thousand. And there's one. And everything centered. Is God, is God holding out on me? Is he not good? What should Eve have said? He is good. Are you kidding me? He's magnificently good. Look at all that he's made. We walk with him in the cool of the day. I have perfect relationship with my husband. I have everything that I need. Of course, God has a right to say that's off limits because he's God. He created us. We wouldn't be here if he hadn't, right? I mean, we were only here because of his goodness. Yeah. So then look on, let's look on then moving on to verse number four. Right? The, the serpent's got her on the hook, right? And, and she's, she's starting to drift here with this exaggeration. And the serpent said to the woman, the next phrase, you surely will not die. Well, now we've moved from just planting seeds to now this is just an overt contradiction of God and what he said. It's no longer subtle. It's no longer, hey, let's question this and think about it. Now it's like, oh. No, God did not say that. You surely will not die, right? That same idea. He's holding out on you. He's making this sound way worse than it really is. You will not die. It's this overt contradiction of God. I think it's really interesting. Commentator about this said, you know, this is actually the first doctrine in Scripture that is denied. That Satan stands up and denies and, and, and plants this lie and tries to subvert. It's this doctrine of judgment. Think about that for just a minute. The first thing Satan calls into question and tries to stand in opposition to is this understanding that there are no lasting consequences for rebellion against God. There's no judgment. You surely will not die. I don't care what God said. Right? Right? Do what you want because there's no consequences for it. We're free to do whatever we want. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Sounds like we're reading something off of social media today, doesn't it? Not, not out of Genesis chapter 3. And this is why as we go through it and as it unfolds, I want you to see the magnificence of Scripture, right? This is pinpoint accuracy as we walk along. Yeah, that's right. So let's move on. The next phrase. For God knows, verse 5, that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil you see there the phrase that for us to look at here for a minute knowing good and evil no good and evil now this is partly true but it's totally false well to interject yeah, right, you wanted to go back and is this hit. an is this an apple tree daniel <laughs> There's another thing we read into the assume, right? Our cartoon drawings. Does, does God hate apples, God but he really apples. likes oranges? Yeah, or pears. Or... All right. So why then is this tree called the knowledge of good and evil? That's, that's what we're thinking through. This is very intentional. This is actually very deep and very profound that the tree is called the knowledge of good and evil. So with God, think about that with God. God knows good and evil. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, but God knows good and evil on a level of omniscience. He knows everything, right? He sees it from that perspective of knowing good and evil. 
But when, when the serpent says, hey, the reason God doesn't want you to eat this fruit is because when you do, you'll be like God and you'll know good and evil. Is it the same kind of knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, it does. They won't know it on that level. They're going to know good and evil with the emphasis on evil from an experiential level, right? They are going to become evil. So it's partly true. They're going to know good and evil, but they're not going to be like God in knowing good and evil, right? They're, they're going to become evil. You had a great point that you brought up in, in the part before the good and evil, right? The, the lie that Satan got her to believe in this moment about being like God. Yeah, so it, it goes back to that cosmic party pooper idea. And that is, hey, uh, you will be like God. Now, are they already like God? Yeah, they've been made in the image of God. So they're, in, in all the ways that God intends, we are like God. But, but here, the, the category changes to, well, you got to ask this question. Up to this point, who is the one who has declared that which is good and evil up to this point? God, right? He created it and said that it was good, right? He's the one who has declared that which is good. So, so the category changes here whenever, the, whenever Satan says, look, you will be like God. He is, one, suggesting you're not already like God. Well, we know they are like God. But two, he is, he is saying you can be elevated to equality with God. You can be the one who declares good and evil yourself. It's your own declaration of good and evil. That's why it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you take it and when you eat of it, you are declaring yourself, I will determine what's good and evil. See how that makes sense? And you see how this ties back into Genesis chapter 1 as God is creating. Every time he creates, he steps back and it says, and God saw what he made and behold, it was good. Right? Moses is wanting to draw our attention to who has the authority and the right to declare what is good and what is evil. It is only God that has that right. And so it, even those, those accounts are tied together. There's, there's a point, there's a message here that we are supposed to get. And it's this, at the heart of what's going on in these verses, it's not that Satan is throwing out this temptation for Adam and Eve to break a rule. Right? It's like, oh, you silly kids. You know, I, I've warned you, right? You know, I told you no play ball in the house. Right? I mean... You know, I've told you, don't make me have to tell you again, right? Yeah, it's but, not that but innocent. But Daniel, boys will be boys. Right. Like, okay, this is the last time I'm going to tell you kind of a thing, right? It's not. That's not what's going on. It's not this temptation. And you could look at this passage and say, what's the big deal? Why, why would God be so harsh just because they ate a, just an insignificant, silly piece of fruit? I mean, couldn't he just have over, overlooked it? Right? Isn't that something we could just excuse and say, okay, let's try this again. Right? we we got to work this out a little bit. But that's not what's going on. The heart of this is not that it's just a temptation to break a rule, but it's this right here. And it's a phrase the commentator Jason referred to uses, and I think it's so good. And it, it actually stings when you say it, and I think that's the point, what makes it so good. What's going on here? This is Satan's attempt to get Adam and Eve to de-God God. To de-God God, right? It's not about rules, right? It is an attempt for God's image bearers to set themselves in opposition to God, to say, I want to be the one who determines what is good and evil. God, I want your job in my life. I don't need you to do it. I want to do it. Now do you see the evil in this? That it's not just a simple 
temptation, but it's actually rebellion Mm -hmm. against God. Satan is starting a revolution, (laughs) if you will, against what God has created in this world. One, you know, we're talking about threads, and I want to bring this in before we have to move on. Look at verse 6. It says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Take and eat. Where have you heard that phrase? used in another place where else do we say we at the last supper matthew 26 verse 26 jesus with his disciples says take and eat this is my body that was broken for you here's an important thread in scripture take and eat that brought on the fall that brought sin that introduced sin into the world In order for that to be reversed and man to have hope of salvation, Christ would have to die before the words take and eat meant salvation. Very intentionally to draw our attention to what man brought on in their fall and in their rebellion and what Christ took on himself. To restore us to the Father. So important. All right, we got to keep rolling. Let's look at verses 7 through 13. Bigger chunk here. You did such a good job the first time. It was so dramatic and engaging. You want to do it again? Yeah, as long as I don't have to spell. (laughs) And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Then they heard the sound of uh, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, well, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, that is God, said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to me ate. She gave it to me from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, well, will the serpent deceive me, and I ate. Lord, oh, is that where I'm stopping? Yeah. Are we over there? All right. So in this section... Right, we said there's four key movements here. This next one, we're looking at the initial consequences of the fall, the taking and eating. And the first initial consequence you see there, it's a massive inversion of creation. How God designed back in Genesis 1 and 2, how God, the order that he established, we see in the fall this inversion of that. And here's what, here's what I mean by that. In creation, in Genesis 1 and 2, we have God. What does he do? He creates. Right? But then he creates man. Now man and Eve, man and woman, Adam and Eve, they have this incredible position under God. They had this opportunity to love one another. Right? But also, we could say dominion, but that's harder to spell. So I'm going to say rule, right, as his regents, right, with under his authority, the, the authority of God. He says, I want you to rule. I want you to have dominion over the earth. And that's exactly that, for man to have dominion over creation, to fill the earth, to multiply it, to subdue it, right? And so this if you will, in a really rough sketch, this is the order that God established. 
God who creates, creates man in his image. He puts them in this relationship to love one another. It's not good for the man to be alone. And so there's this perfect human relationship that he gives them. And he says, now I want you to to be my representatives, my image bearers. And I want you to rule over creation. And I want you to fill it with more image bearers of me. That's the correct order. But look at how that inverts in the fall. Now we see in Genesis chapter 3, we've got the creation, right? Specifically, the serpent, right? Who now, one of creation in the serpent, seduces, deceives man, causing man to deny God. You see how it flips in just a few verses? Satan's plot, his plan of deception. So important to see how this is playing out and the initial consequences of what's going on. But there's more. Look at what goes on as we move on here. Their eyes were open, right? What else do we see? What was one of the things that if they were to eat this fruit, they would what? Surely die. Do we see death? Do they die? I mean, at the end of Genesis chapter 3, they're still alive, correct? Physically. They don't live forever. forever. Right? There's so many ways we could see death is occurring, right? In in this section, in this initial consequences. It's basically, we need to understand this. If you detach yourself from the creator or the life giver, you die. And that, that, that's what we see begin to happen, even in these verses. Spiritually, they are cut off. Right? They, they no longer have the ability to have a relationship with the holy God, with their creator. Spiritually, they are dead in this very moment that they sinned, that they rebelled. But we see death start to weave its way into every part of creation from this moment forward. Look at what it says about them, uh, starting in verse 7. It says the eyes of them were opened. And then it goes on to give some explanation and some descriptives about what those open eyes now gave them. Right? Hey, eat this fruit. It's going to be wonderful. You're going to be like God. It's going to be so good. But then the minute they eat it, uh uh-oh. And that's And now this is just a little quick aside. Isn't that so like Satan? I mean, think about it in your own life for just a minute. Whisper it in your ear. Do it. It's okay. No big deal. Right? It's not going to affect anybody but you. Go ahead. Everybody else is doing it. Don't worry about it. But then the minute we do it, you loser can't believe you, right? I mean, you're you're nothing. You're nobody, right? Working both sides of it. I mean, that, that is who he is, this deceiver that is bringing death and destruction to the world. But look, look at this. I mean, the thing that they were promised now, think about it with me for a minute. Now, there's no pleasure in it, is there? Do you see anything good in this moment from just what, what happens? What does it say about them? They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord. And what did they do? They hid. Right? And then God calls them out. And then what do they start doing to one another? Yeah, they turn on each other. Right? And they start blaming one another. So, in this moment, in these initial consequences, there's no pleasure in their sin. 
There is a loss of relationship with God. They're now hiding from him when they had walked with him prior to this. There's shame. There's guilt. Right? They're covering. And innocence has been lost. It's been lost. There's no way back. They can't undo what they've done. That's clear in these verses. And that's the whole press for their nakedness. To, to, be, to be naked in, in front of someone is to be completely vulnerable. You have, you have nothing to hide. But immediately we, we see here they do hide. And you got to love the blame game because Adam says, look, it was Eve and it was the serpent. And by the way, if you pay attention, he says, Eve, who you gave me, God. So he's like, as far as I figure it, you gave Eve to me and the serpent. There are three parties that could be guilty here as long as it's not me. <laughs> Let's get that clear. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, the broken human relationships, they're blaming. They're trying to justify, self-justify. When it's only God who can justify, right? And if we were to read all through Scripture, we're going to see man's attempt to justify himself. We're going to see it play out all through the narrative of Scripture of man trying to do what Adam and Eve are doing here in the garden. It's just going to be this cycle that repeats over and over all through Scripture. Because at its core, it's the same thing. It's idolatry. Right? It's this idea, I want to de-God God. Right? I've got to justify myself rather than be justified by, by him. Right? And so as, we re- as you read through scripture with an understanding of Genesis 3, it becomes so clear they can't go back and undo what has happened. Right? It's kind of like the game with, with youth group where you, where you squeeze out the toothpaste out of the tube and you tell them, put it back in. And you can't do it, right? There's no way back. But you know what that does? That shouts with a megaphone that there's only a way forward. And that's the cross. We can't go back to Eden. But scripture from this moment forward points to the cross. As the way of hope. Right? As the way to be reconciled, to be justified. By God. All right, moving on. Verses 14 through 19. All right, I'll give you a break. I'll see if I can do these, okay? Oh, thanks. All right. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And then Adam And then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and from the dust and For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So now we move into this section in this third part here where we see these explicit curses that come down as a result of the fall. So the first one with the serpent, what do we see there? Says he's cursed. This is how the serpent lost his legs. This is how the serpent lost his legs, right? Like, so this mode of transportation for the serpent, it becomes deeply symbolic. So now this imagery of the serpent is now connected to everything that's slimy and low down and disgusting, right? I mean, 
And I would completely agree with that statement. Anyone who likes snakes needs to have their head examined. Amen. Right? Amen. I mean, it is, not, it is not natural to like snakes. There's only one good snake, and it's a dead snake. All right? That is, that is my philosophy on snakes. All right? But we see, we see this symbolic, the, sim, the symbolism in this, right, with the serpent, it, this attachment, what he did, this deception, and what the destruction that it brought about, this inversion of what God did. It's like God puts a, there's, there's a, <laughs> an edict now. It's like, it's disgusting. It's low down, right? It's bad. It's no good. But then he moves on, and we see here this next part where in verse 15, this is such a beautiful verse in Scripture, where he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you will bruise or crush him. Right? He will crush your head, and you will bruise him on the heel. Right? This, this verse, verse 15, is called the Proto-Evangelium. Right? It just means first gospel. This is the first mention of the gospel in the midst of the darkest time right? of sin entering the world. There's hope in verse 15. It's, it's this ray of hope that God is going to do something. There is a plan to reverse the curse of sin and the fall. This promise that it's going to get better. God is going to do something that is going to crush the head of this serpent who has caused all of this destruction. Through the seed, right? Which is one of those fun words that's woven throughout the scripture that is a, is a singular plural that is going to be picked up on Abraham's promised seed. And sometimes you, you translate that all of your descendants. But then Paul in the New Testament picks up on that and says, don't you understand seed is singular. All of it has been pointing to one. There is one who is coming from the woman and he will crush the serpent on the head. The seed of the woman is the promised one. Amen. You know, in Romans 16, verse 20, write that down and go, go look at it later. It's so rich, right? It is all God's doing, right? As Christ being pierced, right? His blood being shed. His sacrifice to make atonement for our sins. To be our substitute is going to crush the head of Satan and his agenda to invert and destroy what God is doing, right? It is all God who is going to accomplish that. But Paul in Romans 16 verse 20 says this, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Isn't it a beautiful picture and understanding of the gospel that as we live as new creations under the gospel in submission to him, right, with Christ in us, empowered by the Holy Spirit, living with Christ as our king, we get to participate in that work of crushing the head of Satan and his plans and his agenda to bring destruction and death and decay. That God allows us as those who have been redeemed to participate in what he has accomplished. I mean, that ought to just make the gospel just come alive in even a richer way. To just see the beauty of, how, of what God is doing, how intricate it is, how detailed it is, and how powerful it is to take what Satan did and to reverse it. And to use the very creation, the image bearers of God who fell, to then turn around and to be used by him to thwart the plans of the enemy in the world. To shine the light of Christ so that people would see him and be drawn to him. Amen? It's a beautiful picture. Looking on in verse 16, we move to the woman. The curse towards the woman. What, what is it, ladies? Uh -huh. 
<laughs> Dare not even speak to this one because there is no understanding about what that is like from this person. I know enough to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pain in childbearing. This is significant because this is the most fundamental right and privilege that was bestowed on the woman, mm-hmm. and now it becomes pain filled. And it even has loss associated with it. Right? So, this beautiful thing is now a painful thing because of sin. But it goes deeper than that. It's not just the childbirth. What else is it? The second part of verse 16. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Right? This language is used again, by the way, in the next chapter when it comes to Cain and Abel. And we see that relationship being destroyed, right? The first murder. In the same idea that it will rule over you. Sin will sin wants to have mastery of you. Right, that was God's warning to Cain before he killed his brother. Same language here, right? Eve, you will want to rule over him. Right, and he will rule over you. We see dysfunction, right? The fabric of human relationships have been corroded because of the fall. We see that here. But then the man, verses 17 through 19 To Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree. This screams, Adam, your prime allegiance was supposed to be to God. That's who you should have listened to. And because you didn't, all of creation is now going to be subject to death and decay. Right? This very ground that I created, this beautiful garden that produced fruit, this perfect environment. Now you are going to fight it all the days of your life just to survive because of sin. So there's curses attached to this. But then in verses 20 through 24, we see long-term effects of sin. I think we can get through this quickly if we want to read. You want to? Yeah, now, now the man uh, called his Uh, His wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living things. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Uh, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and he might take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and Uh, And at the east of the Garden uh, of Eden, he stationed a cherubim and and a flaming sword, which which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. All right. So right here, especially look at verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. We've got to think back to when Adam and Eve attempted to clothe themselves after they ate the fruit, right? They did it with fig leaves. Did God rebuke them for covering he didn't say, don't do that, right? Let, let's, just, let's just be open and honest and, and let, let's just live happily ever after. Let's just, let's just turn and go back, right? There's no need for this covering. Is that what God said? He never rebuked them for covering their guilt and their shame. But in verse 21, what does he do? He actually makes a more durable covering for their nakedness. It's the first death. Yes. And it brings about the first death. How are you going to clothe them in garments of skin unless an animal gives its life to make that covering? And so here's another thread. This is the the beginning of another thread, of a long thread of bloody trails of sacrifices that will ultimately lead to Christ's sacrifice. To take our sin and cover our shame. So here's just another, it's another foreshadowing of God's plan of redemption. Right? The New Testament tells us that before the foundation of the world, God planned to send his son. Right? So that's why we read here in the very 
beginning of the story, this thread that points to there will be one to come who will cover our shame and our guilt, the thing that we could not do. You know, last two weeks ago, I gave you an assignment to read Genesis 3, but then to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, just for time's sake so we can get to a couple of things. We're not going to jump in there, but just write in your notes there. Go back and read verses 20 and 21 of Romans 1 and verse 23 and read it thinking about what we've covered tonight. Okay, I'm going to leave that there for you to do. And you'll see just just striking similarities to what's happening in the garden and how it's still playing out even as Paul writes to the Christians there in Rome. Yeah, it's, it's Romans 1. Specifically look at verses 20 and 21. It starts with since the creation of the world. So it immediately wants your mind to go back to the beginning. And then verse 23, it says exchange. They exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, for a created being. It should bring to mind what we've already talked about, this de-godding of God. Same pattern, same behavior going on in Paul's day that should make your mind immediately go back to to the garden and what we're reading here in Genesis chapter 3. So that whole section, but 20, 21, and 23 are the ones that I really want you to pay attention to there. All right, so takeaways. I want to spend a few minutes here. we got about 10 minutes. Um, So I want to take a little bit of time here just to say how does Genesis 3 do a couple of things. Fit into the whole Bible, but also into our lives. What do we do with this understanding and how should it impact us? I'll let you lead off because I know you had a couple things there that you wanted to. Uh, well, you want to cover these and well, you may go through those real yeah, quick. Okay, cover I'll those go real those. quick and then All we'll right. talk about. So threats. the three the three headings there that you've got this understand we need to understand willful rebellion here, right? And what I mean by that is this, right? There there is this understanding, this idea now that morals and meaning of life right and wrong, right, that those are not established things, that those are just part of the evolutionary process, right, as humanity adapts and learns to survive, right, we, we, we get morals for, for this time, right, we will, we will get this sense of meaning and right and wrong because it's just about survival and adapting and those who do it best will be the ones to, to survive and those that don't will, will go away, right, so it's this idea that it's fluid, that there are no absolutes, Right? And that's not what Genesis 3 shows us. Right, Man was created in the image of God. There is a right. There is a wrong. Meaning is attached to God. Our identity comes from Him. Right? So we've got to understand what we're seeing in Genesis chapter 3 is actually willful rebellion. Right? It's not just an evolutionary process where, where man is adapting and changing and, and it's all fine. No, there are absolutes. There's authority. And because of that, what Adam and Eve are doing is willful rebellion against the authority of their creator. So that's an important thing to take away and understand and apply even in our own lives. The next one is to understand that the supreme evil is not evil that we commit against one another, although that is evil, right? There's wickedness all in our world, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's awful, right? It, it's disgusting. But this, what, what Moses wants us to understand when he's writing this in Genesis 3 is that the supreme evil is not horizontal, it's vertical, right? And that horizontal evil, the evil we commit, man commits against man and woman against woman, right? It's a byproduct of this dimension of evil. Man's rebellion against God, de-godding God, is actually what causes the brokenness that we see in the world around us. I can't stress enough how important it is to keep that in your mind. Otherwise, the roller coaster of your emotions and your heart will go on when you see the wickedness in the world around you and the way it will make you question, is there a God? Does he love us? 
when I see the wickedness in the world, right, if we get consumed and focused so much there on the horizontal and we forget what we, this understanding that all of that is not God's doing. It's a result of man's rebellion, that evil against our creator. And that's why we have some of the pain and the suffering that we see in our world. That's what we're talking about there. And then the last one, right? In Genesis 3, it forces us to understand the greatest need of humanity. D.A. Carson said it so good. I wish I could do it as well as, as he did it. But he says, you know, if man's greatest need uh, were healing, physical healing, he would have sent a doctor. Right? If it were, and he goes on, he goes, if it was this, God would have yeah. sent a politician. If it were, you know, if it were, you know, conquest, he would have sent a military leader. Right? He has all these things. He says, but he didn't. Man's greatest need was reconciliation to God, so he sent a savior. Because that is our greatest need. And, and here's what I want us to remember. You cannot make sense of the rest of the Bible until you accept and come to terms that our greatest need and our greatest problem is our sin hmm. and how it separates us from God. Without that, none of this is going to make sense because Scripture is clear. What we need more than anything is a right relationship with our Maker. Yeah, amen. So I'm going to give you two quick threads um, that uh, of the way that we see Genesis 3 uh, repeated. And the second one, we're going to end on exactly that. Uh, the first one is, is the threat of temptation. Um, there are three major spots. Uh, Genesis 3, and then the, the temptation in the wilderness, the wilderness wanderings out of, out of Egypt. And then in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4 forces you to, to pull in both the wilderness wanderings and what takes place in, uh, in Genesis 3 and incorporate those into a theology of temptation. It's why as we went through this and as we unpacked it that it's not a nursery rhyme, but rather there's such sharpness and such intentionality on the way that Satan continues to work and continues to tempt us. Everyone in this room was like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's right. And that's exactly what takes place like in Matthew chapter 4 in Jesus' temptations in the wilderness when he goes there. Um, so a, a, a whole thread there. Uh, but, but the one that we want to land on uh, and conclude tonight um, is the tale of two gardens. That is, that you move from the Garden of Eden where uh, Adam had the relationship with God, but in the fall, he ends up hiding because he is broken and he has uh, broken fellowship with God. Because of his sin, it is separated and he now hides. And all of that can only be undone in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's, there's, there's coming another son of Adam, the second Adam, who is going to come. And in that garden, instead of hiding... He's going to present himself. He does all the spiritual warfare there in the garden as he hits his knees and he begs and pleads his heavenly father, is there any other way? Must I drink this cup of condemnation and wrath. Romans chapter 3 talks about the silence of the condemned. When Paul argues in Romans chapter 3, he reaches a climax in about verse 19, where he basically says, one day you will be before the judge and before the throne, and your mouth will be shut. You have no rebuttal. You have no reply. Your mouth will be shut. 
We always have an excuse, don't we? Adam blamed everyone. You gave the woman to me and the serpent, right? But on that final day, when you stand in the condemnation of sin, your mouth will be shut. You know, Scripture makes a point. Jesus' final plea was in the garden with his father. And after that, Matthew repeatedly points out he was noticeably silent. He did not give defense. He just moved along, silent as a sheep before its shears. Why? He was in the silence of the condemned because it was from garden to garden. And after the garden, he moved with a purpose. Him and I were talking earlier. I I think Jesus' experience of condemnation and taking on our sin and all that that entailed and that entire movement, I think it began at the garden. It was henceforth afterwards. Because where Adam fell, Jesus took it all on. From the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's what it's all moving towards. Threads, the intention, the purpose of the Bible. And God intends you to see this. He intends you to know and to understand that where we fell, his son came and brings victory. Let's pray to that end. Our Heavenly Father, we love your word. We thank you for this teaching this evening, uh, for the study and preparation uh, of Daniel that he put into it to allow us to be able to think and to work through your word and how it comes alive and how we can be um, sharpened and, and quickened to, to think well and right that you are the author of good and evil and you are the creator and you are the one who declares. And, and our sin is an act of rebellion against you and the way that we are tempted and, and, and even the, the curses and difficulty that we walk through, but always with the hope because of your goodness, with the hope of the redemption that comes in Jesus Christ and the seed of the woman in Jesus Christ and him and him alone. And we praise you for that and we thank you for it. Help us to understand your word and the truth of it and how to live this out in our lives, Father. This is such an important foundation to understanding our Bible and we thank you for this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Yeah, you're